My name is Deron Chavis, urban farmer, community activist, and food justice advocate. Join me and my comrades as we talk resiliency, community, social justice, and why black space matters. What's going on, man? Hey, man, hey, what's you doing? Going? Hey, what's going on, man? <laughs> so, uh, we're here. Black Space Matters. Why don't you tell the people your name, um, I guess your title, and what it is that you do? Well, my name is Patrick Johnson, and I'm a permaculturalist slash farmer. This is the airport food forest. Uh, we are right across the street from Richmond International Airport in Sanston. So, uh, you know, I've been at, at this space since 2013, and, you know, we've been uh, growing food and try to feed uh, uh, Richmond since that time. Nice, nice. So what is a permaculturalist? Permaculture is an ecological design system based on careful observation of nature. So essentially what permaculturalists are trying to do is try to mimic the processes that we find in nature. Permaculturalists use terms like food forests as opposed to traditional farms because a lot of times permaculturalists are trying to uh, not only produce annuals, which most farms produce, but also produce perennials, uh, tree crops and bush crops. So you're gonna take us around a little bit, show us some of the features of the space and why it is you're doing some of the practices that you're doing here. Absolutely. All right, let's go check it out. All right. Well, this is uh, my main growing area right here. These are strawberries. And so uh, this was actually planted last year. Mm -hmm. But um, the thing I guess that's special about the way I grow strawberries is I, I use a method called Hugo culture. Mm. Hugo culture is it's a German term. It means hill, hill culture. What the concept of Hugo culture is, is basically you're bearing wood and uh, other organic materials like compost, manure. You know, anything that you have that's organic, you can basically put in a Hugo culture. Put soil on top of that, and then you plant into it. But basically what you're doing is you're trying to uh, increase the microbial life, the, the fungal life in the soil. So as that wood and you know, all that material that you have at the base of this uh, bed break down, basically it's acting as a, as a giant compost pile. There, this has no fertilizer, no pesticides, no herbicides, nothing on it. You know, this is, these are just naturally growing strawberry plants. It holds water very well. As the wood ages, for example, it soaks in the water like a sponge, and then when it's dry, the water is released. You know, when we have prolonged droughts, actually, it's an advantageous situation for me because it'll basically I've set it up using that hugo culture methods, and, and uh, you know, everything else is taking care of itself. I see people that got watering that don't have this type of lushness, you know, in terms of their uh, vegetation. Let's see what else you got going on over here. Wow, blackberries. So yeah, these, these are blackberries. I planted this section in 2015. And they basically are, are now uh, propagating themselves. And uh, you know, basically it's now a question of keeping them under control. Come back and prune them uh, at the end of the season, you know, and, and you know, try to take weeds out as well as, uh, you know, cut back the old canes to try to keep them productive. It's a lot of berries over here, bro. Well, I get some and then the, the birds get the others, so. <laughs> so, but you know, permaculturalists don't mind that, you know. Per, uh, we know that uh, everything is uh, related to each other. Everything is connected. So, you know, the, the birds are also eating, the, eating some of the insects that would attack the plants. We know that they are part of uh, nature's plan. So, uh, uh, permaculturalists don't get upset by that. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing to address, like, your creepy crawlies, you know, your aphids or whatever types of pests that might normally attack somebody's garden space. So out here, uh, you know, I follow organic principles, but, you know, like I said earlier, permaculture is actually beyond organics um, in that permaculturalists try to be in sync with what nature does. So nature doesn't have to use uh, chemicals to grow food or to deal with pests. It's a cycle of life, you know, things, one thing feeds on another thing, right? right, right. And it's only when that, those things get out of balance 
uh, when you run into problems. People might look at this bed right here and say, oh, that's weedy, you know, you got all kind of weeds in there. No, no, that's intentional. This is an insectary, you know, this is, if, if you, if I, if I cut this down, you'd see all kind of beneficial insects coming out of there. Praying manti, spiders, uh, ladybugs, you know, all those good insects that help us control and keep the, the challenging insects down. I, you know, there's no bad insect, they're just, you know, it's part of the food cycle. But, uh, you know, they're challenging up for us because we're trying to grow food. You created a habitat for the beneficial insects to live and thrive on your farm instead of trying to chase all the bugs away. Right. And, and uh, the thing that people forget is that I think it's like 90, over 90 percent of the insects on the planet are what we call beneficial. It's only like 10 percent that are challenging. When you, do, when you use something like a broad, broad spectrum uh, insecticide, you're killing the good with the bad. So this is uh, my high tunnel. I know you know about high tunnels. For folks who don't know, a high tunnel is an unheated greenhouse. Let's go inside and walk through a little bit. We're gonna keep it quick, because I know it's hot. <laughs> well, you got growing in here. <laughs> right. Primarily what I've been growing in here since I started it have been uh, tomatoes and cucumbers. Okay, these are tomatoes right here. This is watered by flood irrigation. This particular area is one of the lowest spots on the farm. And so when it rains, uh, it comes off that roof and it, it channels into here. Amazing work, man. Let's uh, go on the other side. So uh, what's the origin story of Airport Farm? Like, I mean, we're in a literal forest right now far cry from the area that you're growing on. Tell us a little bit how this whole thing came to be. Basically, I bought this land in 2013, and it was all wooded, and it had mostly pine on it. I did nothing for an entire year but come here and observe. You know, I, I observed how water moved through the space. I observed how light hit the space. In the design for my farm, I used all the observations I made here. In permaculture, we try to you know, use everything. You don't want to create any waste. That's one of the principles of permaculture. The pine that were cut down, I had them made into boards. And you know, I used them in some of the structures that we have here. You know, some of the hardwoods I used in hugel culture, the hugel culture bed. Now, it's a learning process, it's a continuing process. And as long as I own this land, you know, I will continue to learn. This is amazing. We're going to uh, check out the early stages of your food forest and some of the Hugo culture beds. Uh, so let's go on to that side of, uh, of the farm. Man, I'm really, really impressed. So what is a food forest? A food forest is basically a, a man-made rendition of a forest. Trying to put things that we consider to be more, quote unquote, useful to us. You know, that's a black cherry tree right here, that, this big tree that, that's open up. Uh, we have apples, we have a Arkansas black apple tree. We have, this is a turkey fig tree. That big plant right there is pokeweed, and most people think that's a vicious, nasty weed, but it's really a very helpful plant. I use it on the farm as a chop and drop. It takes a lot of nutrients up, and then basically if you chop that down, and put it near the plants that you're trying to grow, then it'll provide those nutrients back to those plants. So this is a big hugel mound. Uh, you know, it's got strawberries planted in it as the edibles, but there's a lot of things going on. It's got honeysuckle growing in it. The founder of permaculture, Bill Mullison, used to say, nature is very shy, she likes to be covered. <laughs> so if you open it, you have a bare space, you know, nature's gonna put something there. What nature is doing is fixing the soil for you. Man imposes his will, but you know, if you leave it alone, nature's gonna re say, this is what really is supposed to be here. So the Hugo culture beds, like this is rotting, decaying wood that she, that's been dug into the ground. And so out of that, the native plants have basically reclaimed that space. They're trying to. Oh, trying to. <laughs> and you're kind of like trying to find that symbiosis between the, the basically try to get some production out of it versus and you know let nature do her thing but you know obviously um, you know being a commercial farm you know I still need to get some type of return back on this I see where you get your name 
airport food force. It's the airport farm for real. <laughs> What brought you to agriculture? Like, what made you want to get into this work? What brought you to this space? My journey into agriculture started when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I was a Peace Corps volunteer for two and a half years in the Philippines. I worked with uh, small farmers, farmers who were barely, barely making it, you know, and, and one of the things that I was doing with them is trying to encourage them to grow vegetable gardens. They were not getting enough nutrition, and the families weren't getting enough nutrition. And that was the beginning of you know, me getting into agriculture, sustainable ag in particular, because you know, we wanted to try to encourage them to use things that they already had as opposed to going out and buy fertilizer and things like that. People used to laugh at me in the Philippines because I used to go around, they had water buffalo. I used to go around and collect the water buffalo crap and, <laughs> and take it and make compost out of it, right? They saw the results, and you know, I, th I thought I was you know, fairly successful at doing that and, and helping people uh, learn how to just you know, use what they have to, to grow food. I ended up going back to grad school after I finished Peace Corps. Uh, got a master's degree uh, from Cornell and, and Ag. Uh, my plan was to go back overseas and work, but you know, you know plans get sidetracked sometimes. Check. But from that, I kind of developed an aspiration to someday have some land that. I could, uh, you know, kind of do my thing on. Right. You are one of the only black permaculturalists that I've met. How does that feel for you? Permaculture, I got into permaculture. I was uh, an apprentice at the, in the agroecology program at UC Santa Cruz. That's what really race bed gardening came from and became popular in the United States at that program. Part of their curriculum there was permaculture. I was like, wow, that's what I've been doing all along. <laughs> you know, it just kind of tied everything together. And permaculture is nothing more than people taking indigenous knowledge and then basically formatting it and putting it in a book form so, you know, it becomes more popular and Western cultures can say, ah, yeah, you know, we invented this. <laughs> the people who get credit for inventing permaculture, they really didn't invent it. They basically just synthesized it and put it in a book. And when you synthesize things and you put it in a book, you get credit for it, you know, and that's the way history works, in, in the, especially in the West, right? right? right, right. It's just nature. Mm. That's all it is, you know, it's synchronizing what man wants with what nature wants, you know, and, and marrying those two. And yes, I'm one of the few African-American permaculturalists, but I think it's something that more African-Americans have become aware of and, and you know, in tune to. And they probably are doing it. They just don't know that they're doing it, you know? It's like I was, you know, it's like, you know, you don't know you're doing something until you get formally introduced to it. Right, so. right, right, right. As we've walked through the space, one wouldn't even know this is a residential neighborhood. You know, when you're talking about farming, people are traditionally mentally wrapped around like, okay, there's these rows and it's, it's very organized and da-da-da-da-da. Yeah. Da, 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 da. So when you bring the permaculture into, you know, you got neighbors, how does that, how does that relationship go? Well, it's been a, a challenge, to be honest with you. Um, some of the folks just, you know, didn't understand what I was doing. You know, I'm, I'm this strange guy, black, and I happen to be African American in a neighborhood that's, you know, still predominantly, you know, European. Some people get suspicious when you show up and start doing something like this. You know, and it, like you said, it don't look like traditional agriculture anyway. Even if you, if it was a traditional agricultural farm, a lot of these people still wouldn't understand what it is anyway, because most people don't know how to, how food looks when it's growing, <laughs> right? So it's an education process. Me doing permaculture, which is a stranger form of agriculture, has raised some eyebrows, and they, you know, called the county on me a lot, even called the police at some point on me. We've slowly educated some people and educated county officials about uh, the good we're doing, and I think a lot of the neighbors have come around. You still got some hard heads, but you know, you're always going to have that no matter where, wherever you go. Last year has been like a resurgence of people getting into gardening, getting into farming, people aspiring to be more resilient in terms of their food. What advice would you have for young African Americans that have found a calling back to the land? I think that's, that's critical for us as African Americans to reconnect to the land. I uh, was a part of the 
the black farmer, the original black farmer movement and uh, lawsuit with a USDA, and that was with uh, Mr. Boyd here in uh, Virginia. So uh, a lot of us have uh, basically tried to divorce ourselves to some degree from the land, and primarily uh, African Americans are urban people. You know, we live in urban s settings now. But there are a few of us who are starting to realize that we need to re reconnect to the land. I mean, we have such negative and brutal memories of you know, being on the land. And, and if we had lands, a lot of us, we lost it through exploitation and, and corruption uh, that happened by government and by uh, unscrupulous uh, business people uh, in the past. And so it left a bitter taste in our ancestor mouth. And of course, they passed that bitter taste on to their children. And so we have, a, we have this kind of, you know, contradiction with, with uh, you know, us being on the land and, and what we can extract from the land. I, I remember very vividly, uh, I was working at a piece of land that I had rented, and these two young men, you know, it couldn't have been more than 15 African Americans, walked by me as I was uh, you know, doing my, my garden and my farming, and it was a real hot day, and I was out there working my butt off. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the young men said, yo, he looked like 12 years a slave, man. <laughs> I was like, I was like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know, I know it's hot and it's, it, you know it looks bad, but you know, I, I, I want to be out here doing this. I'm not. <laughs> wasn't that analogy just? It just blew my mind. You know that that's the context that 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 they that a lot of people still have about you know us being on the land. I think it's slowly changing. I think people are starting to starting to uh, wake up and and realize that it's very important that we uh, we get back to the land in some way, manner, way, or, or fashion. To that point, what would you describe as some of the, the, the main reasons why we need to be reconnecting back to the land? What makes you feel like this is important? Well, you know, land is power. You know, um, it's the basis of our entire economy. Without land, you basically have no power. Whether it's home ownership, which you know African Americans lag in home ownership, so the Hispanics and you know other uh, minority groups, Native Americans, that's the first basis of our economic system is to own a home, you know. Uh, and from there, you can do other things. You can do things like start a business. You know, you don't have to be farming. Uh, you can start a business because you're going to use that land as your capital base. So just looking at it from that perspective, not even looking at it from the food perspective. You almost have to be connected to the land in order to achieve what they call the American dream. One of the things that you learn in permaculture is the concept of resilience. Now, if I walked away from this farm and came back three years from now, I would still be able to harvest food from here. But because of the things that I grow here, you know, the perennials, some of the annuals even come back, you know, as as food producing crops. And even the things that we call weeds, like, you know, most people look at this and say this weed. Dandelion, that's edible. You know, uh, pokeweed, that's edible. You know, at, at certain stages. Honeysuckle, you can eat, you can eat a part of the honeysuckle plant. So if you walked around here, you could basically feed yourself without even planting anything. You know, one of the reasons why I believe that that the United States has slipped in terms of our leadership in math and science is because people, young people, aren't connected to the land anymore. I mean, think about we used to be an agricultural country. You know, everybody. You know, and so basically, you have to learn this stuff. If you're a farmer, you have to know all the skilled trades. You have to be an hydrologist. You have to be an engineer. You have to be a, a scientist, a soil scientist. I mean, think about all the skills that you learn from being on the land. And you know, when you divorce yourself from the land, you're divorcing yourself from, from nature, and nature is basically how our system, the whole universe functions. When we're talking about permaculture, talking about land, talking about the importance of black people engaging in this space, what would be your final words if you had to sign off? The important thing is to get back to the land. It's, it's not to be a permaculturist like I am, or. You know, even to take a class in agriculture or whatever, it's just to start doing it. You know, just go out there, and even if you don't own the land, you know, you know, if, if you have an apartment, start growing some plants. You know, just start learning and start teaching other people about it. You know, you can start small, and, you know, if you want to grow, you can grow. But start. That's the most important thing I'd say is, is to start. Well, man, I'm thankful that we had a chance to chop it up today. Yeah, you know, this has been a blessing, man. I learned a lot from you today. It's All been, right. it's been, it's been powerful. Hey, thank you. I'm Deron Chavis. You're tuned into Black Space Matters. 
Join us next week as we highlight some of the most prolific black growers, farmers, and people that are stewards of the land throughout the central Richmond region. Thank you.